I always thought there was a right way to animate. And I was quite naive in thinking that every time my mentors taught me their new workflow, I thought this was the way it had to work. It wasn't until I got the best piece of advice ever, a good animator has a tool set of different workflows and they set the right one for each shot. The workflows in this video are by no means the only way to animate and they might not even work for you. But over the years, I've animated lots of different shots and anything that's come across my desk, I've been able to tackle using one of these three methods. I've also made a video or streamed each of these workflows separately. If you want a more detailed sort of example and I guess real time demonstration of these workflows, go watch these videos. I spend a lot of time on them. They're great. Now the three workflows are pose to pose, spline blocking, which is my own name for this, and layered approach. Let's start with pose to pose. This is the most traditional method of animating, probably the most famous. And I still think it's the best way to learn for a beginner. This workflow is about focusing on the appeal of posing. You really have to think about the animation principles and how they apply to each pose. It's also really good for getting really good feedback early on in the process. You can block out your story beats and then make acting choices. This method also works great for cartoony shots or more stylized animations where the posing is super important to the shot and the timing is snappy very quick and weight and things like momentum are slightly less important because you're further from reality. The key thing about this workflow is to plan really well. You got to make your thumbnail sketches, you got to make your video reference and make sure you understand what the shot's gonna look like before you enter Maya or Blender. On the screen now is my student work, actually my first body mechanics assignment. But here you can see I sketched out all my poses. I then filmed reference from the sketches. I found my breakdowns, my key poses, my anticipations and then block them out into Maya. The actual method of blocking out your shot itself can change depending on the person. The method of blocking that I've chosen and that I was taught at Animation Mentor is find your golden poses, then find your anticipation poses, then find your breakdowns, and then find your in-betweens. The method of finding, I guess, your breakdowns is quite difficult for some people. But the main thing to think about is you have your two golden poses, your breakdown, think about what's leading and what's dragging. So for example, if your hips are going first, you can maybe key them towards your second golden pose and the chest could drag, so they're keyed towards your first golden pose. Once you have all your poses in, every two frames, every three frames, you can then go to spline and I guess polish your shot. Now some tips for this workflow though. One thing you might think about is doing a rough blocking pass, but I would advise against that. Blocking should actually be your polished animation. Think about everything that goes into your shot from the weight, from the momentum, from the arcs, from all of the animation principles, that should be in your blocking. So when you go into spline, you hit the button spline, maybe tweak some curves, get the weight going better, but really within an hour or two, you should be done. Blocking should be 80%, splining and polishing should be 20%. But like I said, everyone is different. If you want to go to spline earlier, that's completely fine. It depends on how you want to work with your shot. Some small key tips for beginners. Make sure you're animating every single controller. Don't have keys where the pose is the same on both poses. So for example, maybe the arm goes up, the arm comes down, but the chest is the same place. That doesn't make sense in nature and it's really jarring to watch when you're giving feedback. Make sure every single body part is moving for every single pose. To help with this, I would really open up the graph editor and work with the graph editor open from your golden poses at the start of the animation. Seeing your curves and seeing how the body parts move is really important. And also making sure your poses make sense in relation to each other. You can craft the prettiest, the nicest pose in the world and make another pose as well, make the prettiest and nicest second pose. If they don't make sense together and they relate together, where the torso is twisted wrong, or maybe one position, the back is this way, but then it's back the other way, it's not gonna connect, it's not gonna make sense. Just make sure everything is connected. So a quick pros and cons list. For the pros, you get really nice crafted poses. There's a really clear sense of story and story beats, especially in the blocking pass. It's easy to change and edit things, especially timing as you go through. It's really good to get feedback early on and you can make changes also very early on. The cons of the shot though, it can be quite slow animating this way. Planning is really important, but if you plan wrong, you can backfire and you will be lost, you won't know what to do. Keeping track of body parts is also quite hard. Everything must be keyed, animated. You can get lost in this process as well. It can also be hard to get a sense of timing when doing pose to pose. You lack any real sense of movement and timing can be lost when entering spline. For this reason, going into spline can be quite demoralizing and really throw off people's work, especially for students. The next method is called spline blocking. And it's something I kind of named myself. Basically, we take our video reference 
and then you take your shot and block it out on eights. This is really good for shots with movement, especially movement around the room, or even a fight scene. Things where there's lots of things going on, it's a bit chaotic, you need to get a really good overview of the shot quite early on in the process. So not so much worried about golden poses here. We do want to make sure the posing is good though. Don't think about bad posing, but we're not looking for story beats necessarily. We're looking just for, I guess, a systematic sort of timeline of the actual shot. So like I said, we're blocking on eights, we go in, make our poses. After blocking it out on eights, we can take it to the director or to our mentor and get good feedback on the basic layout of the shot. This does suffer slightly with story beats and acting choices. In this case, you may want to block out on fours for some sections, but essentially this method is so fast. If there's ever a misunderstanding with the director or the storyboard artist, you can get something pretty clean in front of them and they can give feedback on what you've done. I use this probably the most at work when I'm not quite sure what's going on and I want someone to tell me, yep, that's what I want, do that. It's quicker than pose to pose, because you're not so much worried about crafting these ideal story poses. You're just taking a reference, blocking it out, and then giving it to the director. That's why you need to have really good video reference for this. Don't use your first take. Go in, spend a few hours, spend a morning making some good reference, and then you just block out quickly in an hour. If then I'm told to make all these massive changes, I then don't have to worry about wasting time. I've spent two, three hours max. I go back, make the changes, Keep going now the reason i call it spline blocking is because i'm animating on eights though i want to do it with auto spline or spline turned on i find if i can see the timing at this stage i can make really good iterations and make changes to the shot assuming i've got the go ahead from my director after the eight workflow i stay into spline and i will then go on to fours and then to twos and when needed go to ones i'm not quite doing in-betweens in the traditional sense but i'm doing my in-betweens and breakdowns both breaking down the shot into as few frames as possible this does take some getting used to when working in the spline mode though because things are kind of very loose and noodly at first when you make your changes and you make your poses and bear in mind we are making poses we are we are keying everything on every single frame we want to make sure that we're still applying the principles of animation to these poses that means the poses should themselves be pretty also, the arcs seem to be included, and things like overlap, especially when the fingers and the hands and the arms, they need to be included in this blocking pass. So don't be afraid to go back and change some of the poses or change some of the overlap in your previous iterations. It's definitely a slightly layered approach, and that's why I think it's a hybrid between pose to pose and fully layered workflow. This is the method I've used for the longest time, and it's what I fall back to if I'm not sure what to do with my shot. So this was my first acting shot that I did at Animation Mentor. I've come a long way since then, but I still use the same workflow to this day. I spent a good few days making this reference. I retook it, I refilmed it, I got feedback on the reference. When I went into Maya, I could block this out in about a day. So this blocking pass was really quick. I got more notes from my mentor. I can make more changes to the timing, the tempo. Then I go into fours, into twos, and then I go to ones if needed. When doing the lip sync and the facial animation, I would include the eye masks, so the eyes and the eyebrows, in the body. So do it with the body. But then the lip sync I would do at the end separate to everything else. So make sure that the body is almost polished like a pantomime shot, like almost perfect. Then go back in, add in your lip sync, and that should give you the best result. This means that lip sync can be kind of a supplement to the dialogue. You're kind of forced to make your body mechanics the pantomime version of the shot. They can sell the action, they can sell the emotion, and sell the story with gestures and body acting. And lip sync can just supplement that with I guess, the cherry on top. So the pros of this workflow is it's insanely fast to get something out there. It helps clean up misunderstandings between the directors and the storyboard artists and the animators. It's so easy to make changes, especially to the timing of the shot. You can shift keys back and forth. The cons though, you really need reference for this. This is the workflow you really can't do without reference. The pose to pose workflow can kind of sometimes be okay without references. You can craft these nice posing. But with this eight workflow, you have to have a plan from the start. Without a plan, you're gonna fail. There's no real sense of spacing and timing when doing it on eights. Things are so far apart that you haven't got any kind of, I guess, key poses to lock down your animation. And just like pose to pose, we have to track everything simultaneously, all the arms, limbs, you know, the eyebrows as well, making sure it's all locked down and posed on each frame. And for some shots, especially acting shots, it doesn't really work because there's not enough information there on eight to get the story across. And this situation, doing a pose to pose workflow with golden poses, might be the better option. And again, use a graph editor, keep it open, it's a godsend. So the last method, and the one I probably use the most frequently now, 
is the layered animation workflow. This can mean a few different things to different people. For example, some people think it means using a cube and geometry to animate your shot, and then you attach your rig to that geometry. I have done that. That is a great way to work sometimes. When I say layered, I kind of mean a bit more iteratively with individual controllers. This Mandalorian behind me, I animated this entire thing on live stream using a layered workflow, but basically I'm taking my cock and maybe my feet at the same time and I'm animating them kind of in a straight ahead workflow to get a sense of timing and weight to the shot. Typically, I would do a kind of a rough pass of the cog, then go back to the feet to get them kind of placed in the right location. Go back to the cog again, I polish it more. Back to the feet, polish it more. It goes back and forth, back and forth until they kind of work together. And then maybe once those three things are working well, I can go up to the chest and then work on the chest a bit. Back to the cog back to the legs, and I'm building my shot from the ground up. Now, I joked on stream that this workflow could actually be called, look at my shot, what's the worst thing I can see? Fix that first. Do the on repeat. I want to fix things that I think are causing the biggest issue to the shot, which is quite hard to see at first because everything is wrong, which is why this method is more advanced and I think something you shouldn't learn unless you've learned post to post workflow. But this does work quite well when the reference is lacking or it's hard to find the exact shot you need it for. So I use this workflow a lot for creature shots at work as well. It's really good when you have this big massive, you know, you know, fat like a cat or a dog with this massive body of stuff. Just getting it moving through the scene is quite important. I can then use the back legs or the hind legs, get those placed correctly, and then kind of move to the front and go through my shot like that. This doesn't mean that I'm only working on the cog for the entire shot and then go to the feet. It is definitely a back and forth process, but by doing this, I'm not really having to rely on reference so much. And things like, you know, filming it myself, which is impossible for dogs or cats, I don't have to worry about too much. That being said, don't mistake not having reference for not having a plan. You should still have a plan for your shot. Think about where they're going, where they're coming from, maybe sketch out the thumbnails, or maybe do use that cube just to get the path going first. But something that you can use as your reference, which isn't just a video. It's really important to know where you're going with the shot. If you just start at frame zero and go ahead in space, you're not going to have a good time. You're going to get lost and you're going to get, you know, confused. So some more tips for this workflow. You've got to be really careful with what you're changing in the graph editor. It's sometimes quite easy to go in and shift things up, shift things down and check if it works and kind of use hope to see what's going to happen. Hope is the killer of your animation. You have to know what you're changing and why you're changing it. It's okay to, you know, undo stuff and redo stuff again, but make sure when you do make those changes, you know why you made them. There's a thing called noodling animation, especially when you go from pose to pose into spline. You take your curves, move them up and down and hope it works. That will never work with layered. You've got to know what you're doing. It's also essential to remember that all the principles of animation still apply to this workflow. You need to have good posing. You need to have good weight. You need to have good arcs. Some things are easier than others. Having good arcs is quite simple with this workflow because you can track them from the start. But having good posing sometimes is something you forget. This shot behind me, after finishing the shot, I did realize some of the posing was a little bit weak, which is one of the downsides of this animation. The biggest pro of this workflow is it's so fast to get from start to finish. Something that might take post to pose, you know, four or five hours, I could probably do in one hour using a layered animation. It also creates very realistic movement. Because we're not blocking it out together, everything is kind of already offset. There's, there's natural offset within the animation itself. Like I said, it's also good when you don't have references because you can really just combine your ideas in your head and your thumbnails and make something good in Maya. It's also really flexible with individual curves. You can make changes to things like the weight, to the speed, or to maybe overlap stuff really fast, just shifting the individual keys in the graph editor. But one of its pros is also its biggest con, which is making timing changes to the entire shot can be tricky. Your keys are all over the place. You can't just shift a frame back and forth because you might shift things different amounts if things are keyed differently. It's also very hard to get feedback early on in the process. You have to go quite a long way in the shot before it's presentable. And even then you might have to bake it down to twos or to fours. You know, hopefully it looks similar to your animation. Show the director, get feedback, put it back into your layered animation, and then you can start working on it again. It's a bit tricky to get feedback. I use this most when I know exactly what I have to do and I've already been signed off by the director. It's also not very good for facial animation, you know, especially with cartoony stuff. You have to really get these nice golden poses with facial animation and with doing a layered approach it just feels all too spiny. The eyebrows moving too much. It just becomes a spiny mess. So with heavy heavy dialogue shots I would probably stick to 
one of the other workflows. It's also easy to get lost in the animation. The curves can be quite confusing, especially if you're new to the graph editor. You know, all these things going all over the place. There's no coherent information. It's all random keys everywhere. It can be a bit confusing. That being said, the flip side of this is it's quite an empty graph editor. Things may be all over the place, but there's not keys on every single frame. You click on one curve, it's pretty empty. It's not too confusing once you get down the basics. So after watching this video, you might be thinking, okay, so I use one workflow for this entire shot. I'm not gonna change. That's not true. I frequently use all three workflows in the same shot. For example, this shot now of a horse and a man, the man was done post to post, the whole thing post to post for the man. But the horse was done completely in layered workflow. Two separate characters, but the same scene. You can even use the same character and different workflows in the same shot. The first 50 frames, he's doing maybe a dialogue bit, he's talking, and then he stands up, walks across the room. You can take the first 50 frames post to pose, and the walking part, maybe do it layered, or maybe do it on eights. There's not really a right or wrong answer to this, it's really what is suitable for this section or for this shot. And that's the key thing you should take away from this video. There's not a wrong way to animate. You animate how you want to animate. If it looks good, it's great. If this was useful, please do think about subscribing. Go watch my live streams. I've been doing it quite a lot on the weekdays. Most weekdays, Monday to Friday, I do at least an hour. Pretty open to suggestions. You know, I animate what you tell me to animate. And also I have a Discord down below. You can send me your work, especially if you've done my tutorials. I'll give you feedback, I do it on live stream or separately. Um, all free of charge, just join my Discord, send me a message and say, hey, what do you think? Thanks for watching, have a good day and happy animating. Cheers, bye-bye.